most musicians have an intuitive understanding of what timbre is. Uh, timbre is often referred to as the color or the tone of a particular note. Um, so for instance, if a, a clarinet and a bassoon both play the same note, um, you'd be able to distinguish them because they have different timbres. Uh, and this is really based on, it's determined by the construction of the instrument, the material, the physical vibrations, um, the register, the dynamics, uh, basically all of the physicality of the way the instrument is played contribute to every instrument's timbre. Um, now, there's a, <clears throat> a way that musicians uh, and scientists often break down timbre slightly more scientifically um, using the fast Fourier transform. This is kind of a complex mathematical equation that you, we don't need to get into right now. But basically it says that uh, complex tones, like those that uh, occur when we play acoustic instruments, uh, they can be broken down into a bunch of simple sine waves. No caps. Complex tones can be broken down into simple sine waves. A sine wave is just a pure tone that has no overtones. We're all relatively familiar with the sound of a sine wave. I'll play one right here um, so you can hear it. So that's a sine wave uh, vibrating at 220 hertz. We'll come back to this software and I'll explain it in a few minutes. Uh, but a sine wave basically has no overtones. It's just a pure tone. Uh, so more complex tones, things like clarinets, bassoons, uh, guitars, pianos, whatever, um, they can be understood as a collection of sine waves. And the timbre is entirely determined by three things. One is the frequency of each sine wave. Uh, frequency is essentially the pitch. Um, the amplitude or the volume of each sine wave um, and what is the third one? Uh, oh, how it changes over time. This is a little bit more subtle um, and we probably won't get into that too much of that right now. We'll just focus on the first two of these. So if we were to take a handful of sine waves, give them particular frequencies and a few different amplitudes, what we would actually hear is not a bunch of individual notes. We would hear one complex tone, one complex timbre. Now, this is a really interesting psychoacoustic effect whereby the ear thinks of those, interprets them as just one vibrating body, one instrument, for example, that's just creating a, a more complex uh, timbre. It's really fascinating. So to demonstrate this, I'll play <clears throat> a couple timbres right here, a couple sine waves right here. And actually, you know, first I'll play them all together. And you'll hear a note, it's going to be an A. But as you can see right here, in the spectrogram and the sonogram, which I'll explain in just a minute, what we're actually hearing are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different pitches. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. I don't know where the seventh one went. Uh, but we're hearing a, actually a collection of pitches that are being combined into one, one tone. So if I were to just cut some of these out, I'll lower the volume of this one. Right now, we're just left with a single sine wave, one pure tone. Uh, of course, I hadn't given this one these frequencies, uh, so these were inaudible. 
Um, so the premise here is that uh, timbre can be broken down into a bunch of simple sine waves. And what we're seeing right here on the right are two ways that those complex sounds are visualized. In this case, in the spectrogram, what we have is the x-axis right here is frequency. So as this goes further to the right, the frequency goes up. The y-axis is amplitude, so this one's a little bit louder than this one. You can see I'm controlling them right here with these uh, essentially gain sliders, I'm turning the volume up and down when I move this. Um, and then you can see this kind of flickering a little bit uh, when we play the sound. And that's just little minute changes in, in the sound over time. Uh, this one, the sonogram, is a little bit different. In this case, the x-axis is time, the y-axis is frequency, and the darkness of the line is amplitude. So let's switch this up. I'll make the higher frequencies be increasingly louder. Uh, these don't have any uh, bearing right now. So you can see right here, they're getting louder over time. And here they start really light, and then they get darker. If I were to raise this, So only by changing the amplitude or the volume of each of these sine waves, um, we're able to get a, an interesting timbral change, a change in the timbre. So that's exactly what's happening when you're playing an instrument. You're playing a guitar, for example, and you play near the bridge. You know, what's going to happen is you're going to hear more of the higher frequencies and slightly less of the lower frequencies. Um, so access to computers, uh, especially in the 1970s, gave composers a lot of new tools that they could start experimenting with and playing with. Um, and they began to incorporate these things into their their compositions. Um, I'd like to just demonstrate, um, right here we're working with a synthesized sound. So we have a bunch of sine waves that are being combined to create timbres. Um, over here I have actual recordings uh, of some samples. So we have a clarinet. And there's something really interesting about the overtones of the clarinet. You see right here the fundamental frequency. This is the A that we're hearing. Here's the first overtone, it's pretty quiet. The second overtone, it's a little bit louder. The third overtone is quiet. The fourth overtone is louder, quiet and a little bit louder. So basically the odd overtones um, are really quiet on a clarinet. This is a, a common trait because of the construction of the clarinet. It's a closed tube on one end, essentially. So the uh, odd partials right here, um, you know, the fundamental, the third partial, the fifth are the loudest ones. Um, if we were to take a look at the bassoon, you see actually the fundamental is a little bit quieter than the first overtone and the second and third, and then it drops off steadily, peaks up a little bit at the end right here. And you can see the clear change the bassoon right here and the clarinet and here's a trumpet and you can hear a car horn outside as well so the trumpet's a little bit more even all the way across and this is the only thing really that accounts for the difference in timbre between the clarinet the bassoon and the trumpet is simply the relative amplitudes of the overtones. Uh, if you notice, the overtones all have the same frequencies. Right now, all three are playing at the same time. What we're hearing is the A. Uh, and then the harmonic overtone series of the A. Okay. Um, so 
if we were to analyze these a little bit more carefully. Let's take that clarinet, the A3 clarinet. We'll drop it into Spear. Again, Spear is a free uh, open source software that you can download and start playing with. Um, this is more similar to the sonogram down here uh, because we have the x-axis is time, the y-axis is frequency, and the darkness is the amplitude or relative loudness of each partial. So this is almost identical to the sonogram. The difference is that we have much more precise uh, analysis. This sonogram, for example, notice how the lines are really fuzzy. Uh, we actually have no way of knowing what frequency that is exactly if we just look at this. Um, but with Spear, we are actually, if you hover over one of these, and you look down here where the cursor is, this is an A3, 220, right? Here's 440, an octave above, 440 hertz. Notice how this one's really quiet. There's a, an octave and a fifth above. This is an E. Here's another A. Here's a C sharp. Etc. So these are all the overtones. Um, and you can really clearly see now the relative amplitudes. So if we were to take these frequencies 220, 440, 660, 880, etc., make this one the loudest. Actually, let's do that um, over here in the other software. So we have 220 hertz right here. That's this frequency. We'll make the, that the loudest one. Then we have 440, pretty quiet. Then 660 up here, a little bit louder. Then this one's also really quiet. Then that one needs to get progressively quieter. Um, so if we listen to these sine waves now, We're not hearing the clarinet, we're actually hearing the sine waves. Here's the original clarinet sound. And the curious thing, if you look at these, they kind of look alike. Right? You have, again, this alternating loud and soft partials. Um, so we're able to resynthesize complex tones using just sine waves. It's one of the most fascinating things about, uh, about this kind of um, spectral analysis. Um, this resynthesis is called additive synthesis. It's taking all the partials and playing them together, combining them to create uh, complex tones. It's really that simple. They're basically two sides of the same coin. FFT or uh, spectral analysis is taking a really complex tone, like an acoustic instrument, and breaking it down into a bunch of simple parts. And then additive synthesis is the opposite. It's taking a bunch of simple uh, tones, like sine waves, and then combining them to create a, a complex tone. Um, and we can do the same with the bassoon and the trumpet. I've already done it here. I saved them already. Uh, this is the bassoon sound. Again, it's resynthesized. The original bassoon sound. And obviously it's not identical. You hear a little bit of the air. It's a much richer sound. But it's pretty close. And all I did to try to match these was uh, look at the relative amplitudes of the original recording right here and then of the synthesized part right here and tried to match them. Uh, and then right here is a trumpet. Here's the original trumpet sound. And here's the synthesized trumpet sound. Uh, 
sounds less convincing. But that's basically the premise behind spectral analysis um, and additive synthesis. Again, they're just two sides of the same coin.